Welcome to the Acadad Show. I'm your host, Mark Savant. Today's episode follows a slightly different format. I'm going to be interviewing presidential libertarian candidate Adam Kokesh. He was introduced to me by Chris Cole. Adam is not a father, but he is recognized as if I, a massive problem in the United States where fathers are being removed from the parenting process. And to me, it's very, very concerning. Chris Cole introduced Adam to me as he has some very unique and interesting solutions to the problem of fathers not being there. So today's episode gets a little bit off topic of what our show normally is looking at, fathers and issues that pertain to fathers. But I think that Adam brings a lot of unique experiences and a lot of unique information to the table. You may not necessarily agree with everything that Adam says, but I think that it's important that we keep an open dialogue and look for different solutions to the problems at hand. If you appreciate the show, I would encourage you, please go check out their pages and also make sure to check out the Acted Ad Patreon page. Your pledge, whether it's $1, $5, $10 a month, makes a huge difference. It allows us to expand the platform, to reach more fathers, to create better episodes and better user experiences. With that said, let's get right there into the interview with Adam Kokesh and Chris Cole. Adam, Chris, welcome to Act a Dad, the Awesome Dad Show. How are you today? Outstanding. Awesome. Fantastic. Today's episode is a little bit different because it's a slightly different format. And I'm really excited, Chris, that you reached out to me. I've been doing a lot of research on what Adam's doing over at the, with the Libertarian Party. I've been watching you Chris up there in Tennessee. I'm just really excited to get to a discussion today about the state of fatherhood and where fatherhood is going and and how we can improve the lives of families everywhere. All right. So I'm going to start it off here with a question that's probably going to get you going, Adam. But I want to start out here and say, what impact does government play in family life and specifically in fathers? Uh, it, 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 at what angle shall I attempt to untangle this evil Gordian knot of family law in America? Jeez, Mark. Yeah, you set me up with an easy one. Oh, thank you for this opportunity. I really, I really do appreciate it. And um, I, I feel like I have to start with my dad credentials. Like, I'm really good at dad jokes, and I'm really good at dancing badly in cargo shorts, but I'm not a dad. So I have to, like, you know, kind of come out and be upfront about that. But one of the things that, that I, I really appreciate, especially and relate to about this question and, and the show is that I've wanted to be a father for a long time. And one of the things holding me back, and of course, can't let that be, you know, be the only reason, but uh, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm afraid to have kids in the United States today. Mm. And I think it's, it's a, a weird kind of double-edged sword. The more you know and educate yourself about what it means to have a kid in the United States today, that the government is a co-parent uh, in a legal sense of your government married. Because you can be married to a person and have a beautiful commitment before family, God, friends, community, and not have the government have anything to do with it. Or you can go to the courthouse and get government legally married. That's a totally separate thing. But when you do that, you are creating a contract that invites the government into your family. Hmm. It gives them, a, a, and it's, it's a false legal authority. It's absolute bullshit and nonsense, but it gives them a legal right to come in and interfere and settle disputes and take your kids away and say, if you're not doing this, if your kids aren't getting vaccinated or educated the way that we, the government want them, then we're going to take them away from you. And that's, that's terrifying. You know, more, more than anything else about being a parent, the idea that the authorities are going to step in and say, you're a bad parent and you're not, you're, you're not fit to raise your kids. That's, it's, it's, it's truly deeply frightening. I have utmost respect and, and I have a lot of people on my team, you know, who are parents and, and, and as, as a libertarian who understands how government works, there is a kind of ignorance is bliss effect. Like I almost didn't want to know, you know, hide me from the truth. Let me just pretend that the government's not there. Let me be an obedient wage slave. And let me just, let me just go and do my nine to five and see my kids in the evenings and weekends and just have that, you know, American mainstream family life. But, you know, eventually some of us go, 
no, I'm not going to do that. I, I can't sit by and watch the injustice continue. I can't just sit by while families are ripped apart. I have to do something about it. And I'm really grateful for Chris Cole for putting together Victims of Family Law for Kokesh. Uh, I'm a child of divorce myself. My parents, when I was, uh, I guess, between, geez, I think it was like six and 10 years old. It was four years, nasty, legal, drawn out battle, all the back and forth nonsense. And uh, I think what you're doing, Mark, is so important with the show, not just because it's it's challenging that and, 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 and elevating dads in a way that has been taken out of the conversation, but also a lot of the issues that you cover address this deep-seated shame and guilt and fear that is absolute bullshit, nonsense, that is foisted on us by the authorities to control us so that you don't speak out, you don't tell your story, because they're going to label you a deadbeat dad, you're a bad mom, you're an insufficient parent, you know, and, and to get people to come out and, and, and discuss these issues in the open. And, and I, I do appreciate that you've taken a broader positive spin on this, but man, it is, it is one of those injustices that is just waiting to catch fire and for the American people to stand up and put our foot down and say, no, we're not putting up with this crap anymore. You, you definitely bring up a really interesting point about letting the government in as a co-parent, because you don't really think about it that way, but they're, they're making a lot of the rules when it comes to legally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, access to your kids, paying taxes, benefits, health insurance, all this, all this stuff. And I, one of the concerns that I have uh, as a human being, as American is, you know, a, you've got the government who has a massive influence there. Um, but you also have, the media companies and, and corporations, which, which take on a, a very large role in saying, this is what you can say, this is what you can do. If you don't play along, then you're gonna lose your right, you know, your first amendment right, or you're gonna lose your right yeah. to see your kids. Yeah. Um, you've got a, a, what I would consider um, a pretty extreme way of handling that. A peaceful, uh, uh, how would you say it, peaceful, yeah. Okay. Let me. Yeah. Let me back up and. Yeah. Let me back up and set it up for the audience for anybody who who's unfamiliar with me or the campaign or the background because it it is true that I am technically running for president of the United States, but it's much more accurate to say that what we're doing with this campaign is turning the federal election into a referendum on whether or not the federal government should be allowed to continue to exist or not. And if we want, should we declare our independence as the founders did eventually at the individual and community level, but starting from the monstrosity of the federal government and getting everything back from us that's been stolen, all of the assets of the federal government liquidated, returned to the American people. That's the, just the idea that right now we are fighting for full employment still is insane. It's 2019. The goal should be full retirement absolute economic freedom. This is the birthright that has been stolen from you. This is how society has been engineered to keep you struggling so that you're working paycheck to paycheck, barely managing to take care of your families, that it's engineered. It's not supposed to be this way. Our birthright, our inheritance, everything that our, our prior generations have worked to get for us is being stolen and kept from us by government. And it, in, in terms of presidential platforms. I understand the temptation at first glance to see this as extreme. I would say the federal government is the extreme monstrosity that needs to be slayed here. That's, that's the real extreme. And what we're talking about in terms of policy, I mean, I, just first, the ethics of this. Government is force. Government is coercion. Everything it does is backed up by the threat of violence or an illegitimate property rights claim, or government saying that we own you, you can't decide what you put in your body or who you associate with or, or whatever it is. We own you, you don't own yourself. But don't you, don't you feel like if you completely dissolve that and, and take that out of the picture that human beings are just gonna do what humans do and okay, bomb, hey, cheat, steal, well, kill? So, so what, what you're missing then in the point here is that what we're talking about is not getting rid of government. Okay. Just the fat, disgusting, destructive layer off the top. So what we do at the end of, or what we have at the end of a bankruptcy process of the federal government 
is 50 independent states and up to 562 sovereign native, native nations. So every chance that you have for a transition or that, that a community might need to wean itself off dependency of government, we're not talking about pulling out the rug from underneath anyone. And in fact, when you, when you realize that that's what we're talking about, this is extremely moderate as a platform. I mean, considering how big and over, I mean, how, if I say get rid of the federal government, you're probably thinking, oh my God, all of these government employees are going to be out of a job. And right, it's going to be, that. it's going to be the purge but, basically, but right? It's going to be insane. Like. That's, yeah. I, I promise when we fire every single IRS agent, we won't cut off anybody's right hand on the way out the door. I just, I know that's a temptation for a lot of people, not going to happen, but very seriously here, what we're talking about in, in localization really is getting rid of, well, do you know how many people work for the government in the United States? I do not. And if so, if you if you count if you count all of every contractor and every you know it could be it could be a lot, but it's actually 22 million. Okay, that's that's a lot. It's way more than it should be. 22 million Americans directly work for government at the state, federal, or local level, hmm. and only about three of those 22 million are at the federal level. And as we transition, for example. Federal Department of Transportation. We're not getting rid of that, except that we're gonna cut it into 50 pieces and give each state their part where they already have a State Department of Transportation. It's a small thing to hand that authority and those resources and those facilities to those states. And what you get is an immediately more customized government experience. So we're gonna fire, yeah, about 3 million out of 22 million government employees. Some of those are going to get hired back by state governments in this transition. So really what we're talking about is cutting, you know, maybe 2 million out of 22 million. That's tiny. It's like about a, we're talking about, we're not about getting rid really in terms of personnel, about a 10th of government, but we're talking about getting rid of 90% of the corruption. Because yeah. corruption is exponential as power and authority are concentrated. And yeah, and this is, state governments are corrupt, but I'd rather is, be fighting them than DC. That's fair. This is probably one of the reasons, one of the reasons why Trump got elected is because he, 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 took, he took on that kind of like trigger level of, look, listen, look at what the swamp is doing. Let's drain the swamp, let's get in there. So I think that, I think that people are hungry for new ideas and in new ways of resolving the bloat that I think that the majority of people would agree is is there. Yeah. So I want to Trump, dive in a little bit government's, deeper. Government's grown under Trump. Like, you know, you, you can't, it, it's ins it, it's Well, it continuously mean, grows, right? It's like every president, it gets bigger. I was just saying <laughs> like, it seems like each time we get a new president elected, the executive branch of the government grows bigger, right? Yeah. So, you know, what, how do we, how do we bring this in line with what the, what the everyday father, what the everyday family needs, I guess is where, where we're going. Well, first of all, to that specifically, and I was really shocked to hear about this after Chris formed Victims of Family Law, because I was under the false assumption, ah, shucks, this isn't something I really get to address in dissolving the federal government. It's more of a, a local issue because, as you know, it's DCF, Department of Children and Families in some states. It's CPS, Child Protective Services in some other state. It's, it, you know, th they have all these different acronyms that make you think that these state agencies are, oh, yeah, that's a unique great. It's all based on federal law. And almost all the money for the medical and, and foster care kidnapping kind of nonsense, that racket, comes through the Department of Health and Human Services. So, like, there's this whole layer of corruption, even in family law issues, that is, is directly addressed by dissolving the federal government. But at a more fundamental level, it, it really transcends that. And, you know, like we talked about before the show, if I, if I, if I may sidebar for a second here, and I'll, I promise I'll bring it back to policy, the powers that be, you know, a lot of libertarians, you know, a lot of people who are self-educated and informed about this, you know, make some critical intellectual mistakes in 
assuming that the government is this this monolithic personality or phenomena of a single mind and it's not it's a gang of thieves all trying to get in their piece and there's a general interest there in engineering the system to keep everybody down they want everybody to be a good submissive obedient wage slave they don't want to kill you they don't really want to take your civil liberties. That's just a w means of controlling you. They don't really want you to feel like, uh, like your balls have been cut off because of some bullshit legal situation. And really that's, that's mm, I see, and I've, done, I've been doing civil disobedience activism for over a decade and I go to jail and I, I see people who are in jail for all sorts of nonsense. And it, it's men, it's mostly men, you know? And, and, and when the powers that be want to push everybody down, there's a certain effect that hits men in a very unique way. And everything that is inherent, inherently good in, in that divine masculinity that is essential to being a good partner to a woman, that's essential to being a good father to a child, that gets taken away. And a lot of ways it's, it's you know, that you have the welfare state that leads you know, single parents, men and women, to say, you know, we don't need a, a, a family. We can have, we can, we can do this with government as the provider. And getting to a state where that's not an issue is a much bigger thing for me than really just, well, we're going to get rid of these federal laws and we're going to get rid of this federal incentive financially for the evil that we see in family law. It so definitely. What, I'm sorry to cut you off, but you made a really good point there, Adam, in that, and, and I'm, I'm not positive. I'm just saying I'm a little on the fence. I'm listening. I'm, I'm learning. I'm educating myself, right? Um, I'm not exactly sure personally that the government is the sole problem here, right? But it seems to me that, like you said, when men are being imprisoned at, at much higher rates and committing suicide and these types of things, and in let me preface this by saying that, you know, minorities and women, I think it's really important that they deserve respect. I think human beings in, in general d deserve respect. But right. one of the things that's been really concerning to me is that when I watch a presidential debate or I hear rhetoric being talked about, nobody's talking about the, the problems that are facing men and facing fathers. I just wanted your opinion. Why do you think that is? Why is this not something that's really dis discussed in, in mainstream, why is this not being brought to the table? I, I'm just not really clear on why that's happening. It's just part of the control mechanism of controlling the conversation through media. You know, as you, as you talked about before, as you know now as an independent media producer, that there are challenges we face just, and it's awesome that we have the internet, that we have social media, we can challenge that mainstream narrative directly, openly. We still get censored, we still get shadow banned. And, and, there is a unique bias here. I know that you say it's, it's you know, versus minorities and women. Um, and, and there are plenty of unique disadvantages faced by women and minorities. And I've been to jail where it's, uh, you know, it, I'm, I'm the only white dude. But there's sure. not a lot of women. This is, this is a uniquely male phenomena of, of men victimizing men through government to to compete for control, for resources, for authority, for, you know, all, all the silly biological imperatives. So to, you know, the, the, this deeper issue, I see that there is a, a paradigm shift that goes along with embracing freedom. Now, I, I'm going to challenge you, Mark, because you, you talked about government there, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to define it because I know my definition, but a lot of people use this word government and it's just, oh, sure. the people in charge, even that. Like, so I, I, I ask, I, what, I do a lot of man on the street videos. You know, it's, it's, it's one of my, my staples on YouTube where I go out and I, I talk to random people, stick mic interview. And one of my favorites recently, I talked to two women at, at Harvard University. And one of them had just gotten a scholarship and was bragging about, oh, I majored in AP government in high school, and that's, you know, and, and I said, oh, so you majored in AP government. You can define government for me. What is government? And she couldn't do it. Mm. And it's, it's, the Dalai Lama was once asked, if you were president, what's the first thing you would do? And he said, I would start calling things by their proper names. Taxation is theft. Politicians are criminals. Police 
are a violent gang. Not every single one is evil, but that's the reality of what we're facing here. And so I would ask you then, Mark, I think it's pretty essential before we go any further in this conversation, what is your definition of government? And to, to your point, I think you could ask 20 people and get 20 answers, um, in, in, especially if you go to different countries. But to, for me- there is, one, uh, there is one right answer to this question. Yeah, so for me, government is the body that creates, that recognizes human challenges that are, that are present in current day society and looks for ways to bring all these different people together under some sort of rule of law, if you would, that says, hey, these are things that like, do not murder, do not steal, you know, all these different, the obvious ones, right? Okay. Um, and then some way of creating some sort of discourse so that things can can evolve from there. And but look, listen, you put me on the spot. I haven't done any research. I'm not, I didn't. I didn't take government in college. All right. Yeah. Okay. I took no, social okay. studies in like seventh grade. So. And, yeah, and, and and actually, your I would say your definition is, is still a level better than most, but it's it it still fundamentally misses the central point. And and what you're the the reason. And, and, and I say this out of love and respect, don't get me wrong, but the reason your definition is so wrong is that it assumes a benign intent well, behind yeah. government. That's, that's the challenge. That. You want that, right? You want to yeah. think so bad. And man, you want to talk about daddy issues. You want to talk about how you know, uh, American <laughs> children are, are, are screwed up deliberately in terms of their relationship with their fathers and authority. Man, yeah, you, oh, the government's really good. They love you. No, the government has your best interest at heart. No, the government loves you. It would never hurt you. It would never take, you know, I mean, come on. You know, so, yeah, that's, so, so, yeah, that's very the, the, naive. That's, I mean, look what's yeah. happening across the world. Can I, right, can I say, say something? I didn't say it, but yes, naive is, naive is good. Please, Chris. I, I, so I wanted to definitely listen and let the two of you kind of interact the most that you could. Um, but Mark said, I, I would have said the same thing that you did, Mark, and, 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 and this is what I tell people. Until my children, I'm a, I'm a good father, I'm not a perfect human being, but I'm a good father and I make mistakes, but nothing worth taking my kids over. Until I reach the point where my kids have been taken from me, my financial uh, institution has been crippled, meaning my credit score, my bank account, everything has been wiped away. I went from the sole provider to living at my father's house. That's when I said, how did this happen to me? Then I investigated family law. Then the dots connected to government. Then I met Adam. Then I watched Adam's videos. Then I don't like politics. Adam doesn't like, po no one likes politics. We don't want to vote for anyone. We, we want to be happy. We don't want anyone. We don't want Trump. We don't want Clinton. We don't, we don't want Adam. We don't want anybody. But we're, we've been conditioned because this is the way it's been to believe that this is the way it can only exist. Yes. And Adam, thank you for educating me. It's scary as hell to know, to have my mind open, a sober mind. Keep in mind, I haven't had a <laughs> drink or a cigarette in two years. And so I'm, I'm very high strung and full of anxiety, but I'm, li but I'm listening. And what a mind blowing, uh, every time, since I met Adam, the first movie I think of every time we talk government is the matrix. It literally blue pill, red pill, uh, 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 a farm of human beings plugged up to power yes. machines like yes. slaves. And when you unplug, you realize the reality, the blanket that's been pulled over our eyes. We've been conditioned to believe that this is acceptable. Something happened in my heart when my kids got taken and it's been happening for decades. And I can't go back now and I'm scared. You remember in the Matrix they say, plug me back in, ignorance is bliss. Do you remember that part of the movie? It's a great steak, this steak is delicious. Yes, please, because I'm scared of the machines killing me. Yeah. I want to be ignorant again and live until I die peacefully. But I can't because you took my kids. I'm so scared right now for them and me. And I can't go backwards. And I'm hoping Adam can bail me out of jail one day, probably tomorrow, uh, when I have child support court. 
but that's another discussion. But I just wanted to chime in, you know, Mark, you said government protects us from theft, murder, blah, blah, blah. Government murders, steals, blah, blah, blah. Well, I think the done. problem that I think the problem that you see throughout history is um, any system, any system can be can be corrupted. Um, any family can be corrupted. Religion, like everything, I think human beings use these stories and these systems as, as like you said. Uh, so that brings us, a, a Mark, system that, of control. That brings us back to the definition of government. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I will answer this challenge myself in a minute here. I promise. I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not avoiding the question. I know my definition, and, and I know my definition of government is airtight. And you will not be able to disprove it or argue with it. And when you see it, it is so important in, in what Chris just talked about in terms of a true understanding of what government is. But I want to start, if you, may, if you, if you let me approach from a bit of a sidebar on, on, on the theme of divine masculinity. There is something about being a warrior, being a protector, being a provider that comes with a real clear set of ethics. You stand up for the unjust or you stand up against injustice. You, you protect those who cannot protect themselves and you never use violence unless it's defensive or protective in that interest. You never commit an act of aggression. You never violate another human being who's not hurting you or hurting someone else. And this is the foundation of libertarianism, which is often mispresented as a political philosophy. It is not. It is an ethical philosophy. It says you own yourself, and therefore it is wrong to violate that ownership by anybody else doing something unethical to you. Because you own yourself, because I don't own you, because government doesn't own you, it's wrong for anybody else to say, you can't put that in your body. You have to give me part of your income. We're going to lock you up if you don't follow our rules, even if it's for victimless crime. And that is what gets us to the nature of government. Because you came from this, in your definition, a perspective of assuming, assuming that government has your best interest in art. I, I could tell as you were saying that, Mark, Well, that's the goal, right? That's the but goal. I, which as you were saying that there was some some cognitive dissonance right you're like here because you're, you're str the first time you go well what is government and you no, that, oh that's not hmm you know as you're trying to put the words together and, and, and forgive me if I'm, I'm reading into it too much but there's a really simple answer governments are territorial monopolies on coercion they claim that we understand that every government has a territory right that's pretty obvious yes. we need to unpack this definition just a little bit like, like a we, kingdom we, right right we know that every, every government has a, a line on the map that it draws and it says everything within this line is ours or within our authority and control and within that area it's okay for that government to put a gun to your head literally figuratively and say we're going to use violence to control you. If you don't pay taxes, you will eventually go to jail. Your stuff will be stolen from you because the government says, we own it, you don't. Your control over it, your illusion of ownership is a privilege that we extend to you that we can take away at any time. And when you understand that's what government is fundamentally, you realize that as such, it's not an institution that we're working towards perfection on and someday it's, no, it is fundamentally evil. It is fundamentally unethical. It is based on a premise of violating individual rights. Now, I'm not an anarchist in the sense that, oh no, you can't have any government, but if you're going to have something that's called a government, in order for it to be legitimate and ethical, it has to be voluntary. So the but question how is, do you, how do like, you do that? So I guess one of your, your main points, Adam, is that the government is just bloated, it's controlling, it's, it's using force to collect funds and, and, and steal through taxation, right? But how does breaking it down from one federal to 50 states, that is, to me, doesn't necessarily resolve that problem. Now, instead of having one not. big government, you've right. got 50 big governments. Hey, hey, 
hey, Mark, don't be such an extremist here, okay? Calm down. I know you just, you, you had your mind blown. You're considering a, 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 a real definition of government for the first time, and you want to get rid of all, I understand. Well, I'm, trying to, under, I'm them, trying to unpack but, this into how it, like, it makes fathers and family life better, right? That's yes, what I'm, okay. we're trying to get to. So the answer is that if we're going to transition to a state in which governments, if there are any, are voluntary, they have to be at the community level. Because a community is something that you choose to be a part of, that you can opt out of at any time. In the United States, we've seen what happens if you say we want to be independent. You know, like the way the founders did? Well, gee, the American federal government acts like the British Empire all of a sudden. Hmm. We have to restore that right to declare your independence to say that I don't want to be a part of this community, I'm going to be free on my own land, or I'm going to be a part of a different community, or I'm going to be a part of a community that I'm going to create with people who want to come together and create something based on our values that meets our needs. So getting rid of the federal government really is just the first step. But it's one that's really easy policy-wise. It's something that can unite the American people. Because if you're a liberal, you live in a liberal state, you're a conservative, you live in a conservative state, fine. Right away, you get more of what you want in your state. It's the everybody gets what they want strategy. But people are going to be so much happier because nonviolent relationships are more conducive to human happiness than coercive relationships. It's win-win versus win-lose. I yeah, want think, to replace all the win-lose relationship with win-win relationship. Think and, about wh why we fight. What makes, so I, I know where Mark's coming from because I just kind of am starting to come over to Adam's side. So I can play kind of the devil's advocate in between. But um, Mark, you are concerned and most people are concerned and I'm still a little, I have more questions for Adam too. I'm still learning. Um, we, you know, Mark is afraid essentially that if you take this, we think that government is what makes us stay good. I can tell you right now that people are going to do drugs, whether it's illegal or not. People are going to kill people, whether it's illegal or not. People are going to rape people, whether it's illegal or not. There is sick people in the world and there are good people in the world. But the, the thing is, is now government is bleeding over into the good people and making money off of us. I, I would have never thought about it until you stole my kids. Well, one um, of the things, and, and we just got through Thanksgiving, right? And I'm thinking about what am I thankful for? One of the things that I'm thankful for, at least as an American, is that I can take my daughter outside, go to the park, and I don't have to worry about a bomb being dropped on my head, right? I don't have to worry about being attacked by a rabid pack of wolves. Like, well, to, I mean, the extent, to the extent that you do have to worry about terrorism in the United States, that's directly because of government okay so we can certainly expand on that because again you, you start looking around the world at these other countries that are just completely imploding or have applied like china you have a one child maximum like this is just some pretty bizarre stuff so i think anytime you're challenging the status quo which like you'd mentioned i think oh, yeah. earlier that we've got this duopoly on on government red blue and that's it right uh, anytime you're challenging the status quo you have to try to, you know, we have to really think through, well, what are all these changes? What's this change going to bring? How can we prepare? Because the, it, obviously it's a big change. It's a big change, right? So how do, you, how do you break that down but still give a father that feeling of stability and security that I can go out in my front yard and I, and I, and I, I can feel safe in my community? You know, don't you feel like right. that might be lost when you know, you're breaking it, down the strength. No, no, take, take away the security blanket that's holding us back that's making us less safe. So if, if, if I may, again, back up for just a second, because I'm, Mark, I'm really, I'm grateful for how you're engaging with this. I can, I can like, you're not just asking questions. You're really getting into it. I very much appreciate that. Well, that's why I wanted you on the show, because yeah. you, you, you've studied and thought through this. I've watched some of your YouTube content, which is great, great YouTube stuff, by the way. Guys, definitely got to check out Kokesh on on YouTube, I'll have links, but yeah, I'm sorry to cut you off. So continue. How do we continue that feeling of security? Well, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's a dangerous illusion 
And I'm going to go right to the heart of this. It's the military that we think of as protecting us. And Mark, to say I'm thankful for the peace and stability that we have, I think that's, that's beautiful. And what's so sad is that in the United States, but really in the world, uh, I, I don't know, I've been around the world a few times. Most people are, are not as propagandized as Americans. We are the citizens of the empire. And I was in the Marine Corps, I, and I, I was in Fallujah in combat in 2004. And having been a part of the global war on terror that way, having been a party to a war crime, you know, I can tell you that we were making enemies faster than we could kill them there. And it's not just that that makes us less safe, but I would challenge anybody who's pro-military. And by the way, to be pro-military is to be anti-American, maybe out of ignorance. But let's not, you know, I'm, I'm not going to pull any punches here. The American founders were against what they called standing armies. They favored right. a free market, militia, community-based defense. That's how Afghanistan was the graveyard of empires. That's how America, uh, before it was America, overthrew the biggest empire the world had ever known. And by the way, we get to do that again. Nice perk of this campaign, right? That's it. Let's overthrow the biggest empire in the world. It's an American tradition. This time it's the internal one. Yeah, we get to do that. This illusion of safety is so dangerous because it gets you to give up your right. It convinces right. you to say, well, I'm working for government half the year because that's what it adds up to. The average working American, and I, I assume especially someone in Chris's situation dealing with child support and, and, and alimony and all that nonsense after divorce with kids and all that stuff, you're really sensitive to it. But even for the average working American without any of those special challenges, you are working for government half the year. You might see 20 to 30% out of your paychecks, but you add up vehicle registration, sales tax, all the taxes that's built into every single thing that you buy at every step along the way of production of all consumer goods in the United States. You add it all up. The average working American is working for government half the year, and the excuse, well, we, nah, well, we, we're keeping you safe, so you we need roads. Yeah, we, we need roads. Need the roads. You guys, you couldn't figure this out without us. And there's no way. And and when any, whenever anybody says we need government to do this, when you understand the true definition of government, you can translate that and say what they're really saying is there's no peaceful solution. We need a violent solution. We need to force people to go along with these ideas. And having a military makes you less safe, not just with the making enemies, but at the more fundamental level. And we are lied to from the very, very beginning in how we are taught about this country's history and what we are told war is. And we are taught that wars are fought between countries. It was America versus Japan versus China versus Germany. Nah, bullshit, absolute, utter nonsense. And if you just stop and think past the propaganda for one second, you go, oh, wow. Yeah, wars are not fought between countries. They're conducted by governments using violence to expand their protection rackets. You go, well, if we get rid of the U.S. military, China's going to take over. And do what? Govern you. Okay. So, Adam, again, I mentioned earlier, and we've, we've kind of gotten a little off family life and fatherhood, but I, I think, so one of the questions I have for you is, you know, you, you certainly have made up, so, uh, you've certainly devised a lot of points about if why. I, hold on, let me, let me finish the military point, if I may, Mark, and I'm sorry to interrupt, just to connect, to bring it back to this. Sure. When you give up your divine masculine sovereignty, your responsibility for your own defense, your own protection, whether that's hiring out someone to help, or actually doing it yourself, yeah, you're, make, you, you're cutting your balls off. You're, you're handing them to the man, saying, please be nice to these. Don't step on them. Good luck. Well, to me, it seems like in the history of mankind, right, there's always been some master, someone that's using some metric or system to control people. And so one of the concerns that, that I have as American, I think about this a lot, I think you talked about this on Rogan. By the way, if you guys haven't seen that, he's got a great interview with Joe Rogan. But... You, if we take government out of the out of the picture, well, what happens with these these major technology companies that are controlling our words, our thoughts, our data? 
do you feel yeah. like then all of a sudden we get this huge lopsided shift and then all of a sudden Zuckerberg becomes our president? You know what I'm saying? Maybe no, not. I, I, but. Yeah, I, I think that's a really gross misunderstanding of how we got to this point where the tech giants have so much power in society. It's not, see, government and those companies want you to believe the lie that government is keeping them in check and it's regulations that are necessary for that. And if you look at the history of all corporate regulation in the United States, it's mostly been big corporations asking for that regulation because it gives them oligopoly power. It, it, excuse me, it keeps away competition. It makes it harder to compete with that existing corporate power. And the big thing here is intellectual property too. If it wasn't for the intellectual property record of government, you'd have much more competition among these companies. There's a certain first to market advantage that you could say, well, actually Facebook, it's second to market technically, right? Do you remember MySpace? I do remember MySpace. Yeah, like, are we dating ourselves It's now? really, it's I'm, really their tequila, space. Tequila. Tom's my friend. Yeah. Tequila, <laughs> tequila. So, oh man. Oh, oh, you know you were on MySpace if, oh, okay, I'll stop with the dad jokes here. But uh, yeah, so th this, question of like you know what 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 if you if you get rid of government is again what if you get rid of violence well if you get rid of violence the tech companies won't be able to use it against you when you say i'm going to create my own social media platform you don't have to hire a team of lawyers and accountants for compliance with taxes and regulations and codes and all that nonsense that facebook already has the budget for when you don't have that centralized control of the monetary system reinforcing corporatism so that you as an individual you are continuously paying the inflation tax every time you have a dollar in your bank account or your back pocket that dollar is losing value as they create more through the federal reserve system and right. where does that money go it goes to government it goes to corporations you look at amazon amazon's getting tax breaks in order to start new offices all over the place but mark i i more importantly than the immediate situation with the tech giants, the way you started that question raises a, a, a much bigger, more beautiful point. Where you say there's always been a system of control. There's always been a mass. Right. Is it gonna go, if we get rid of government, does it just transition to this other evil? Right. In order to understand the nature of that evil, the relationship of tech giants and corporations to government, you go, okay, no, that's not a problem. You get all of those corporations are empowered unfairly by government, by coercion, by the violence of the system. So you get rid of that, you're gonna have a leveling of the playing field. You're gonna have an equalization effect, if anything. But what you said about there always being a system. I, I, I love challenging other libertarians with this too. Are we getting more or less free over time? What are the bigger historical trends? And what is the measure of evil of government and a lot of libertarians and conservatives on this count get it wrong when they just automatically assume and operate on the assumption that government's evil is measured by its size and it's not it's how much does it violently take us away from our state of natural harmony of all win-win relationships how many win-lose relationships does it introduce what is the human cost of lives and 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 wealth and and human happiness that goes along with that and it's really simple. I can tell you it, from this thought exercise that I came up with, I would rather live under a huge government that's peaceful and respects civil liberties and doesn't start any wars than a tiny government that's murdering random people every day. You know, really simple. You go, oh, yeah, of course. I'd rather live under a big government that's peaceful than a small government that's extremely violent. And if you understand, again, that government is violence it is coercion again you look at the, the all the violence in the world today but not in sweden yeah right okay no. <laughs> or costa rica but no. yeah 90 90 percent of the violence in the world today is done in the name of government and of the remaining 10 percent, 90 percent of that is directly caused by government with the war on drugs and the war on poverty and the historical trend here and this is the punchline mark for your long-term perspective I don't take this from my own observations or my own study and analysis. I rely on the work of Professor Steven Pinker at Harvard University, who has proven academically that violence 
is not only on a decline historically, but that it follows a kind of radioactive decay curve. And you can track the violence of war and you can say, well, militaries have gotten bigger, their budgets have gotten larger, but they don't kill as many people. That's progress still. It's harder for them to get away with what they used to be able to get away with. And I'm a big fan of Smedley Butler, the major general of the Marine Corps, who uh, was one of the most decorated Marines in military history, got out, wrote a book called War is a Racket, in which he describes himself as a high class muscle man for big business. And that war is always poor men dying to line rich men's pockets. It is always based on a lie. When you look at the scale of violence over time declining, we are living in the most peaceful times in human history by every statistical measure. And it's not some freak thing. It's not that it, ah, nah, nah, it goes along and ah, maybe it gets better, maybe it gets worse, and maybe things will, 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 will get out of control with governments the way they are today. No, 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 no. It gets better over time. Well, I think, I think a lot of that has to do with the wealth in America, too. As Americans, I think we, we sometimes don't understand the horrors that are happening in some of these countries, like in Africa. And, you know, We're very well isolated from the costs of empire. Sure, sure. Well, I want to kind of, again, bring this back, because, and I really appreciate your perspective, Adam, because when I, when I was first educated on the problems and, and I start looking at, you know, 50% of marriages ending in divorce and 40% of kids being born yeah. outside of marriage. And then when a, when a, when a family gets divorced, 85% of dads seeing their kid four days a month, I start looking at these numbers and I'm like, man, we, we need to look for solutions. And I don't know what the exact solution is, um, but I think that's a lot of what Acted Dad is about, is about getting different opinions, exploring different ideas to find out how we can rebuild the fragmented family structure that we're seeing right now uh, yeah. you know, in the United States, when you look at the numbers. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I will say, I'm, I'm, as much as I'm a techno-optimist, a human optimist, I see that we are dancing forward, we are progressing, and, and I point this as if there's a beautiful, smooth decay curve. It's not smooth. There's jagged lines. It's a process of two steps forward and one step backwards, and that's why what you're doing, Mark, is so important. There is a unique phenomena of legal impediment to divine masculinity and the American family in the United States today. And it is a disgusting shame. And it is a huge part of the cost of government. Although I would, I would point out, and I, it's, it's funny, we were making a lot of jokes about this last night, so it's kind of on my brain, but you know, first world problems. Would you rather live in America where maybe you gotta hand your balls to the man in, a, in, a, in an envelope, you know, marked IRS on it? Uh, but would you, or, or would you rather live in Yemen and be, be the victim of uh, the, the, the federal government's foreign policy. And a big part of what motivates me is, is, is seeing that bigger perspective. You know, I, I, I hate to say that this is a secondary issue because for anybody who is facing family law challenges or as a father facing specific challenges from government, I understand that's number one. That's the first issue. I know that from, from talking to Chris, from my own family experience. Yeah, when you get hit with that, yeah, that's overwhelming, and you got to focus on that. You got to take, put your own, uh, you know, oxygen mask on first. Absolutely. But I look at the total injustices in the world today, and to see lives ruined by the drug war, to see families struggling to get by, to see in foreign countries people still getting bombed by by American drone strikes. Your tax dollars are going to pay for that. You know, I, I'll suffer if I have to put off being a father because I want to address these injustices first, and that's what I'm going to do. And, and I see that bigger picture. And, man, it, it, it breaks my heart to peel back every layer of this evil onion. <laughs> but you get to the core of it, and you go, there really is a single concept here that is lack of respect for self-ownership, for ethics, for human rights, that is the basic core of libertarianism, the non-aggression principle, and getting people to start thinking in those terms. We've embraced ethics as a society. Don't hit, don't steal, don't kill. That's why there's been this massive decline in violence and awareness and respect and expanding of our concept of the family. Really ultimately to where in the world today with the internet we can see ourselves as part of a global 
family, a human family. If I may. We don't hit, we don't steal, we don't kill, unless you're an IRS agent or a cop or a soldier and government made that murder, theft, or assault legal. Hmm. That's what we have to overcome at this point. If I may, real quick, Mark, please. Um, you know, Adam's talking about, um, you know, we, we think that government is what, you know, Adam talked about, this is, this is the time we've never been less violent. We've never understood uh, human kindness anymore, respect, uh, nonviolence. And if you look at the way the world is going, like you said, with the drug war, opioids, mental health, um, divorce rates, all the decline, if the government's doing such a good job, why are we falling apart? Um, people aren't traumatized. I'm not going, I don't, I'm not traumatized because, um, you know, the government's not keeping me healthy. Right now, the government is hurting me. I think we need to look at our mental health could be due because people are homeless. Uh, they're having their kids taken away from them by government. Um, people are, um, you know, having, uh, you know, things like, uh, you know, their homes raided, all kinds of things that governments are protecting us from. You know, we, we, the, the natural thing is to gravitate that government's protecting us. You know what I mean? That's why we think we need it. Um, I think that's the illusion. And that's, that's why we keep letting it go. Uh, the government is scary because it's bigger than the three of us. So nobody really wants to fight it. We want a peaceful solution where we want to lobby and legislate and educate and, and be friends with our government and kind of rub elbows uh, and Mark, I, I kind of want, if, if it's okay, can I ask you a question and have you and Adam um, kind of address it? You know, what do you guys think is the solution when we're dealing with family law? Um, that's kind of my focus. Um, how do you get criminals to stop being criminals? Do we need to educate them? Um, when we abolished segregation and we got rid of that, did we need to educate them and make them aware that what they were doing was wrong? Or did we need to march and say, we know what you're doing. You know what you're doing. It's time to stop. Or did we ask them if we could come in and show them this research that we have? They know the research. They are the cause. Stop making um, friends with the enemy. I'm not, <clears throat> look, I'm not an expert in that. Adam might have a more comprehensive response, but my, my belief in, in, again, one of the reasons why I acted at is, is really important to me is that I believe that there, over the course of the past several decades, has been a deterioration of the family structure. You know, one parent, zero parents, government's the parent, corporation's the parent, whoever the parent is, like the kid's gonna be fine. They'll, you know, the television will lead them to victory. And it's to me, it's said a really are resilient. That's what they tell us. Yeah, but I, I think that you know, it's 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 very very crucial moving forward that you you put fathers in a much more prominent, active parenting yeah. position. Absolutely. Instead of putting them in prison or you know sending them off to war and whatnot, let's let's get let's get parents yeah. let's get dads involved and. Um, and not deflate them. A question we didn't even get to was why there's a White House Council for women and girls, but not for boys and men. That's something yeah. that Warren Farrell brought up to me that was pretty concerning. But um, yeah, ab absolutely no. And Mark, you're you're so right that in in the sense of the paradigm shift, restoring dads, restoring fatherhood and men to a, a position of proper appreciation in society is absolutely huge. To answer Chris's question, I love that setup, Chris. Thank you. When it comes to government, my policy is don't negotiate with terrorists. And that's what they are. They want you to be afraid of them so they can control you. And as to what Chris said about the differences in approach, yeah, you don't negotiate with terrorists, but there is still a nonviolent answer to this. And it is so important that we stay true to these ethical principles. Two wrongs don't make a right. The means do not justify the ends. If you're going to make the world a more ethical place, you have to embrace that standard of ethics for yourself as well. 
And so I think there's, it, it, Chris presents a typical activist's dilemma of, do we, do we beg and plead? Do we, do we run for office and vote harder and, and lobby our legislators? Or, or do we storm the castle with pitchforks and cut off all their heads? And I think there's really, there, there's an appropriate hybrid uh, of those two polar temptations, which is that you can pursue a nonviolent answer. You can stand your ground. You can assert a clear moral ethical line and say, we are gonna do this nonviolently. In fact, I think in terms of being in that divine masculine, you don't use violence any more than you absolutely have to. Mm -hmm. And what we're really talking about here in saying let's change the paradigm of government is saying let's put the guns down. Politics is the question of who do we point the guns of government at to better organize society? And the libertarian answer to that question is nobody. Stop pointing guns at people to control them respect their freedom, respect their rights. Let's have some basic ethical standards. That's, that's where we're going. I think that's a good, that's a good, that's a good thought to kind of close that up. Before we, before we enter into the rapid fire section of the show, gentlemen, I just want to give you all an opportunity to plug yourself. Uh, Adam, where can people find you? Where, where do you want people to go to see, see more about what you're talking about? Well, thank you very much, Mark. And I know you're going to be a responsible producer and include all the important links. I'll just say the one for me as the central hub for everything is thefreedomline.com. Three words, thefreedomline.com. You can get my book, Freedom. I have a surprise, surprise. That's the name of my book, right? Freedom, you can get it there for free in every digital format, including audiobook. We sell it on Amazon as cheap as we can get away with. We give them away for free everywhere we go. You can find me on YouTube, my, my massive archive there, all my other social media presences, and you can find kokeshforpresident.com. And if you want to help me win the Libertarian Party nomination, the only chance to cast a vote that counts is at the Libertarian National Convention as a delegate in Austin in May of next year. And Chris has, has been doing such a great job as a volunteer with this campaign, helping people get plugged in as delegates. We also, of course, to keep this bus on the road, no force one, we need money, the mother's milk of politics, you know, and, and, and if you can get behind this message and, and put a little money where your heart is, we would greatly appreciate it. But I, I would just end my plug with this show, Mark, because Act of Dad, what you're doing is so important. For me, getting my message in front of a new audience, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. And as, like I said, I'm a, I'm a techno-optimist. I believe the technology empowers humans in a way that makes us less susceptible to authoritarian control. It is, it is distributed faster and more decentralized with every iteration. But that technology means nothing without deliberate, conscientious use. And that's what you're doing with this show. And I would say for anybody who's, who's watching or listening right now, who's made it to the end of this fun conversation, or at least close, share this. If you didn't like me, you didn't like Chris, but you still like Mark, share some of those other shows. Support <laughs> independent media. Put your money where your heart is, where your ears and your eyes are. Because as, as Mark pointed out, we are up against a media oligopoly that is in the back pocket of the establishment. And what you are doing, Mark, and what you're doing by watching this show, everybody in the audience and participating and helping make independent media possible is so critical. So Mark, thank you. And to everybody in the audience, please support the show. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, very well said, Adam. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Chris, how about you? Where can people find more, more about uh, Chris Cole? Uh, so I'm not running for president. Uh, so I do a lot of little things. And, and I'm just going to mention, obviously, first, victims of family law for Kokesh. Adam has bestowed that uh, very noble cause onto me. Um, victims of Family Law for Kokesh 2020. It's on Facebook. It's on Instagram. It's on Twitter. Um, and pretty much if you search it, it will come up. I don't know all the ats and hashtags to get to all those things. I don't remember what I put. But um, 
I have a song out called Me for Tennessee. It's on YouTube for free. Uh, please listen to it and share it. It's a song I wrote to my children. Um, another uh, thing, um, the Sober Dad, I have a Sober Dad page. Um, it all talks about sobriety, spirituality, being a good father, similar to what you're doing, Mark, um, as well as I have court tomorrow. So if anybody, anyone would want to say a prayer or a shout out or anything, I, am, I have child support court tomorrow. Uh, I have a case that I'm working on as soon as we get off this interview. I have uh, a lot of facts to present. And unfortunately, there still is a fear in the back of my mind that corruption will outweigh the truth in this one. Uh, but we're hoping for the best. I will communicate to Adam and the campaign as well as you, Mark, and other uh, people who have asked and are concerned. If you do not hear from me tomorrow, uh, you know where I am. Um, and, and really, you know, thank you, Mark, for letting us do this. I know we kind of got off topic maybe here and there, but we still got a lot of good information out. Um, we hit some strong points and some, some, some other strong points that maybe kind of went off dad stuff. But I think it's important to realize that the synergy in this, um, you know, if we're not going to solve these problems if we treat symptoms. We have to start digging out the root. And I think Adam, yes. and, and thanks to Adam, I've recognized the root. Why are we suffering as fathers? Why are our kids suffering? Why are we on drugs? Why is there yes. violence? Look at the root. Stop. We need to stop. We are too comfortable behind these screens. Eventually, this will get out. It will get shared. And then what are you going to do now? And that's all I ask. Mm. Also, just created yesterday. So far, there's probably six of us coming, but I just wanted to plug it. Um, I'm trying to put together a, a civil rights march for 2020 in D.C. If you want to come out, if I'm standing there by myself, that's okay. That's what I'm willing to do for my kids. It's not just about sharing. It's about action. Um, so you can go on Victims of Law for Kokesh, and that event has been created, and I'm starting to get feedback from that. So we're going to fight parental alienation, and we're going to fight it from all angles, and thank you for that long-winded ending from me. <laughs> Not a problem. So let's uh, jump into the rapid fire here real quick. Thank you, Chris, for helping put this together. Really appreciate the, you as well. Uh, so rapid fire, let's start with Adam, then we'll get Chris's opinion here. Uh, Adam, favorite story? What's your favorite story? Lord of the Rings, throw the ring in the fire. Okay. <laughs> How about you, Chris? <laughs> Uh, you know, if I, without, without trying to put too much deep thought, since you're putting rapid fire on this, I, I would go back to the matrix. It just, it really yeah. applies to what we've That's talked about. Too. And I got to watch it uh, for free. It's all on, uh, on Netflix right now. So I've watched all the <laughs> movies and I literally thought I was edging, educating myself between Adam's YouTube channel and the matrix movies. And it really opened my eyes to what's going on. It's time to be, it's time to be the one. There uh, Adam, what's your favorite place to vacation? If you go anywhere, where are you going? I own 10 acres in the mountains of Arizona and I chose my homestead spot very, very carefully. I spent so much time on the road going home to the garden of freedom. That's a vacation for me. Okay. I could dig it. I could dig it. Uh, I, I haven't been on a vacation since I was a kid. Um, I would say that personally, I want to be back in Nashville, Tennessee, recording and writing songs eventually one day. Uh, my kids, this custody battle, what we're doing is, is kind of on the, on the front of everything. Um, but anywhere I can take me and my children, maybe to Florida or Disney, we haven't done that yet. It's a good one. Yeah. Uh, pineapple on pizza, Adam, yay or nay? Oh, heck yeah. All right. Realize pineapple pizza. You're both on that, it. That's a shout out to Dan Taxation Steph Berman, another candidate who I'm I'm a big booster of. I think I think Dan Berman would be a if I'm not the not if something happens to me between now and May, Dan Berman would be a great nominee for the Libertarian Party. Fair enough. Chris, your pineapple on pizza, yeah? Pineapple, you gotta put that ham in there because you need that salty with the sweet. There you go. <laughs> All right, final question here, Adam, and I have a feeling you've got a good answer here. You've got a billboard that's going to reach millions and millions of people. What do you put on that billboard? You own yourself. I like that. Chris, what do you got? I love you, Hayden and Nolan. Okay. 
I like that. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining Act Dad, the Awesome Dad Show and sharing some solutions to some problems. Thank you. Peace and love, y'all.